Good morning. Good afternoon. This is Patrick Roberts over at Mountain Speed. Sorry, we're a minute or two behind here. Uh, excited to get started this morning or afternoon, wherever you're located. Um, we have got uh, a, one presenter from Cherry Becker, Dawn Poland. And Dawn uh, is a senior manager over at Cherry Becker. She um, is really tasked with kind of running the cost segregation group for the firm. Um, she handles or she's part of the credit and accounting methods team. Um, really, she serves clients in a number of different industries, but cost seg is really her specialty. I think what you'll find as a financial institution that cost segregation studies could be uh, incredibly valuable for your borrower base uh, if you don't know about them already. Uh, and Cherry Becker is definitely one of the leaders in the country at, at providing those. So hopefully today, um, you know, Dawn can educate us all. She's got almost 20 years experience doing this. And uh, at that end, if you have any questions post-call, feel free to shoot a message to myself or to Mel on our team. And um, we can obviously connect you directly with Dawn. Uh, if there are any questions live and you do want to kind of ask a live question, feel free as well. At the end of the call, Mel will try to figure out uh, who those individuals are and get Dawn the questions. All right, Dawn, turn it over to you. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate that introduction. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Cost Segregation, uh, Advanced Applications for the Life Cycle of Real Estate. We will go through a lot of material today, so hopefully you will enjoy the presentation and have a lot of questions. Please send your questions in. I'm happy to answer anything that you have along the way. Okay. So, Melanie, are you going to advance the slides? Okay. Thank you. That's just our terms of use. You can go on to the next one. Okay. Here's our agenda for today. We are going to look at the real estate life cycle, and this is going to be from an accountant's perspective. We're going to talk about general concepts of cost segregation, how the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act affected cost segregation. We're going to talk about planning opportunities throughout that building life cycle that we introduced at the beginning. Um, and then we, if we have time, we're going to talk about 1031 exchange and possibly um, the opportunity zones. That is time dependent. So if you have any questions on those, you can shoot them over to me after the presentation. Okay, next slide, please. All right, the building life cycle begins when you construct or you purchase your building. Then, as you have, this is a, would be for a building that you are um, leasing, then you're going to have tenants that you put in place. You might do tenant improvements. You might have tenant allowances, depending on how you structure your deal. Then, over time, there's repairs and maintenance that is done to the building. Then, tenants move out and new tenants move in. So, you may demo an existing space and build it out to new tenant specifications. Then, as the life of the building continues, there's major repairs that need to be done. And then, over time, your building's value has diminished to the point where it really makes sense that you need to demolish it, or perhaps you just sell it um, and it's used for something different. So, all of these uh, pieces of the life cycle of the building are spend. So we're looking at, our focus is always to look at the amount of money that you're spending on your building and really what is the most tax advantageous way to treat that spend, be it um, capitalizing versus expensing. Obviously, expensing gives you the most benefit right now for tax purposes. So we really try to analyze all of these transactions to see how you can move as much as possible to that expense category. All right, next slide. Okay, now we're going to talk about the general concepts of cost segregation. Okay, for both book and tax purposes, real estate is required to be capitalized and systematically expensed through depreciation deductions over a long time horizon. So land values have to be separated from the building values and capitalized because land is never expensed. It sits on your depreciation schedule and it, it's cost basis for its life until you sell it. You are not allowed to depreciate or amortize it. However, buildings are expensed slowly through depreciation over their lives. All right, next slide, please. 
for commercial buildings must be capitalized and depreciated over 39 years, whereas residential buildings are depreciated over 27 and a half years. Residential buildings being apartments or assisted living facilities, uh, things like that. The, the depreciation of the building is not intended to match the fair market value over time of the property. It is simply a way to de decelerate the expensing of the spend on real estate, knowing that the use of the property spans a long time horizon. Okay, next slide. Okay, the goal of cost segregation is to accelerate these depreciation expense deductions for tax purposes. This is done by pushing more depreciation into the earlier years of a building's life. And of course, more expense, more depreciation means less taxable income. So properly applying the tangible property regulations, which were implemented in 2014, is also a method of accelerating your expense. The tangible property regulations are the current tax law and are required to be followed, but many people are still unaware of how to apply these rules. They work very taxpayer friendly. Both of these strategies are based on the concept of the time value of money. So we will now talk about cost segregation in detail and then we're going to talk about the tangible property regulations later in this presentation, both of these topics on how to apply these items. Okay, next slide. So the goal of cost segregation is to break your one building asset into its component parts. So we analyze all the pieces of your building and assign a dollar value to each component. The process of cost segregation assigns a value to your roof, a value to your walls, a value to your wiring, your HVAC, etc. And the total of all these values is equal to your cost basis in your building. So it's specific to the amount of spend that you have in that building. Once we assign a dollar value to all the pieces, we can assign a shorter life to some of the components. So we are allowed, for example, to take some of the electrical work uh, and some of the mill work and give it a five-year life. We're allowed to take some of the site work and some of the plumbing work, perhaps, and give it a 15-year life. There are still a bulk of the assets in your building that will need to have the long life, um, the structure itself, and the HVAC system. These are just a few examples just for highlighting that for you. Okay, the typical reclassification results that we see when we break out the building into its various components, apartment buildings generally get 20 to 35% of your original investment broken out into shorter life. Shopping centers, 20 to 40%. Warehouses are only 10 to 25%, and that is because there is less interior to a warehouse. It's generally just your four exterior walls, maybe an office, a bathroom, etc. So when you have less interior build out, you're going to see less opportunity for cost segregation. However, there is still opportunity there. Um, hotels get a great benefit. Manufacturing gets a great benefit, depending on how your manufacturing facility was built around your manufacturing line. Um, medical facilities get a great benefit too. Offices. Um, depending on, your, it all depends on your build-out space. If you have done a lot of aesthetic improvements in your office space, you're going to have more reclassification results. Okay, uh, next slide please, Melanie. All right, so let's talk about an example because I believe in examples. They are the best way to learn and understand a concept. So let's say we have a million dollar basis in a building and we are allowed to take a depreciation expense each year over 39 years of roughly $26,000. Uh, the first year we would only have a half year that's allowed and that's the $13,000. So after we did a cost segregation study, we were able to front load in the early years 35% of the building cost. We put that into a five, seven, or a 15 year bucket. Now, once we bring part of our building life into shorter years, we can now apply the bonus rules, whatever the bonus rules are in effect in the year that we place this building in service. So we are allowed to do that on any asset with a class life of 20 years or less. So on anything that we put in the categories of 5, 7, or 15, we can apply that bonus to. Now, as we know, the bonus rules right now are 100%. 
So a building that you have placed in service in 18, anything that you break out in cost segregation, you can go ahead and expense in year one. That is a great benefit. So think about expensing 25% of your building costs in year one. That can greatly help you with your cash flow in the early years of getting your business and your rentals up and going. Okay. All right, so here's our example. Our original cost being our $1 million and our depreciation before our cost segregation, our half year was 13,000. So after we reclassed the 35% of our value, we were able to do our 100% bonus for our five year. We were able to do our 100% bonus for our 15 year property. So that in addition to our remaining regular 39 year depreciation expense, we're able to have a depreciation expense deduction in year one of $358,000. So when we look at the difference between our old and our new, depreciation, we have now accelerated depreciation of 345000 Once we applied that times our tax rate, we saved ourselves cash savings tax reduction of $138,000. Now remember, this is a time value of money concept, so you will have less depreciation in your back years. So you have to look at it based on how you're going to use that money now, but everybody knows money now is worth more than money tomorrow. Okay, next slide, please. So these are the main questions that we get. Um, what is involved with a cost segregation study? What, does, what do I need to do to make this happen? So first of all, cost segregations are completed by engineers and accountants. We need the pay applications, the drawings, and the blueprints of each building. Uh, if it's a purchase, we need the ALTA survey. We will dissect, based on your drawings, um, very in very very high uh, low level detail we know we will know how many outlets you have how many windows you have your square footage I mean your breakout will be very detailed exactly to the specifications of that building there are very specific IRS guidelines that have to be adhered to when you're doing a cost segregation study so we have to go and see the site um, from all of this data that we gathered then we create the engineering estimates, and then we have to reconcile your costs to the actual costs. We have to properly allocate your indirect costs. These are all your soft costs. They're nothing is um, you know, just as simple as even your purchase will have soft costs allocated to it from your closing statement. Of course, if you purchase, I mean, if you build the building, you've got your contractor payments and your pay applications to the contractor, but you're also gonna have a lot of expenses outside of that, so we will look take a look at all those and come up with a total building basis and use all of those dollars uh, to apply to your breakout. Your final report will be is generally between at least 60 if not 150 pages long and that will provide you know pages and pages of all the breakout of your assets as long as as, as well as all of the tax documentation that goes behind the study. When a taxpayer gets audited and the IRS sees that there's a cost segregation study done. Generally what happens is the IRS agent will ask for the study and then you will just give them a copy of re your report and at that point we don't hear anything else from the IRS because we are very careful to make sure that everything is included that the IRS requires and once they see all that documentation they know that your study has been done properly and that there's no other questions. Next slide, please. So speaking of this, um, there here are the IRS audit considerations that we think about. The IRS recently released uh, the Chief Counsel Advice uh, 201-805-001. This was a cost segregation professional that did a um, egregious misrepresentation concerning the classifications of property. So the IRS does look at the studies and there are bad cost segregation providers out there who really are not following the rules or don't have the technical expertise to actually break down a building cost. So it's not 
that it's not something that the IRS um, does not look at. They do keep an eye on that, and they do um, know when they've seen a bad study because it certainly happens. Um, the, the other thing the IRS thinks about is the land allocation. That is the first question they will ask. If you purchase a building, you need to properly allocate part of that purchase price to land. That is very difficult to do because most buyers do not have an appraisal that breaks down the cost of the land. They only have an appraisal that gives them a value of the building. That's what the bank generally requires. So the best thing to do is to look at the property card for the county to get a proper percentage breakout. Now that property card will not be based on the spend that you just purchased the building for, but it will give you a ratio of what they feel like is land versus building prior to your purchase. That is the IRS, if they ask you how you came up with your land allocation, you need to have something to back it up, whether it's that or whether it's um, some type of um, attorney's advice or something like that because they will, that will be the very first question that they ask about that. The next thing that the IRS is going to be looking at is the proper application of bonus depreciation. This is one thing you should be careful to walk through properly with your CPA. With the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that came into effect last year and the movement from 50% bonus to 100% bonus, there is transition rules that need to be adhered to and that basically means that you need to have purchased the property and had a binding contract on the property, both of those dates had to happen after the law changed. So if you had a contract on a property, before the law changed, but you didn't actually close on it until after the law changed, you are not going to be allowed to take uh, the new laws into consideration for your property. You're going to have to follow the old laws. So you need to make sure that your build or your purchase didn't straddle that date. Your, your CPA should be able to help you with that. All right. So there are several different approaches to cost segregation studies. So when you're looking at different providers, you do need to sort of understand that there are um, different ways that they can be done and what these different ways mean. The rule of thumb approach is just basically a desktop approach. It is sitting down at your desk, looking at your costs and saying, eh, I think that may usually with office buildings, I'm gonna be able to get 10% of my spend and put it into five-year life. And then you just allocate that way. That is not an approved method, of course, by the IRS. You will see it done. You, where I have seen this done is where you have a small CPA firm doing your tax return and they say, you know what, I can do this for you. But just realize that's what they mean. If they aren't going to charge you for it and they're just going to do it for you, they're just making up numbers which when the IRS comes back to you, you will have no documentation, you will have no backup as to how you arrived at those numbers. The next one is the residual estimation approach. This one is would normally be performed by an engineer, but that engineer will go in and look at your building, walk through the space, or look at your blueprints and say, I see this amount of assets that are short life. So they will identify all your cabinetry, your wiring, et cetera, and give it a dollar value that belongs to a shorter class life than the 39 years. Then they will back into the difference. So if they, you spent a million dollars on your building, they will go through and say, I have assigned a value to short life assets of 200,000, that leaves 800,000 in long life. And so they will not break out the dollar value of that long life. There's problems with that approach. It is also not the preferred method of the IRS. One problem is you're not reconciling your total cost. So you have no way to know if you have any dollar values that are misassigned. There's no checks and balances to that. Secondly, we're going to talk about this in more detail. When you get into the tangible property regulations and you're trying to apply those, you won't have the detail that you need from your cost segregation study to properly apply your tangible property regulations. The only way that you will know if your provider is using this method is if you look at the breakout, this will be after you get the study, and you see all kinds of numbers and then you will just see remaining 39-year property in a huge number and there's no detail on that line. 
that's the only way you'll realize that this has been done. Now, the last and the most approved method, the favored method from the IRS, is the detailed engineering approach. This approach breaks out the dollar value of both your short and your long life. So in the end, you will be able to look at your reports and say, how much dollar value was assigned to my water fountain out front? Or how much was assigned to my paving in the parking lot? You will, you will find all of those numbers in there, and you'll be able to see that. Okay. Next slide, please. All right, so the elements of a quality study. So these are right out of the ATG guide from the IRS. You need to have your study prepared by an individual with expertise and experience. Um, that may sound like a uh, something that's just a given, but believe me, it is. there are a lot of preparers and providers out there that do not have the proper amount of expertise and experience. Because cost segregation studies are such a blend of uh, the engineering knowledge and the building knowledge and accounting knowledge, it is very important that you really use people that know what they're talking about. The report needs to have a detailed description of the methodology that was used. We talked about the different methodologies. But I will say that in most reports, they are not specific as to exactly which one they use. That's why knowing how to identify is really key. They need to use appropriate documentation. And we, we, we talked about the documentation that will be required. Now, some of that stuff may not be in the report, but it will be referenced. You know, we looked at the blueprints, we looked at the altar surveys, et cetera. Uh, it's important to interview uh, appropriate parties, and that would just be people with knowledge of the building. Uh, you, a use of a common nomenclature. Now, this is something that the IRS gives us, the standard wording that they want to see on all studies that they know that we're referencing the same items on every study. Uh, there's also a standard numbering system that they want, the IRS wants to see, um, explanation of legal analyses. A lot of the cost segregation rules are born out of um, tax court rulings. So we need to reference the tax court cases that we're using for the different breakout, breakouts of the assets in the study. Uh, they also want to make sure that we determine the unit cost and the engineering takeoffs appropriately. This refers to basically coming up with an estimated value for all of the components of the building. When you purchase a building, what the engineers need to do is assign an estimated value, and then they will apply the cost value that you spent on the building. So in order to do that, they have to have the engineering takeoffs and understanding of what's in the building. That's what that's called. So then they need, you need to organize your assets into lists or groups, and you're grouping it into the various class lives at this point. You need to reconcile the total allocated cost to the total actual cost. So when you're doing estimated values based on, um, there are software packages that tell us, you know, this is what drywall costs in that area per square foot. Those are all of the estimated values. Then you need to reconcile them to the total cost then you need to explain how you treated those indirect or soft costs that we talked about, and then properly identify the 1245 property, which is your short life property, the five and seven and 15. And then lastly, and this is where, this would be a piece for your accountant to also consider, all of your related, anything related aspects that might affect your cost segregation study on your tax return, such as UNICAP or other concurrent changes in your accounting methods. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so we've talked about cost segregation and the concept of that. It may seem like a lot, but from a taxpayer standpoint, you just hire a team to do this for you, and then you get the report out at the end, you hand that to your current accountant, and you're done. So it may seem like a lot, but you just need to understand what you're getting. Now, we are going to change our course here a little bit and talk about the Tax Cuts and uh, Jobs Act that and the changes that came about to cost segregation from that. Okay, next slide. Okay, so bonus depreciation. We've talked about this a little bit, but bonus depreciation, if you don't already know what it is, is the percentage of the asset value that's allowed to be the immediately expensed in year one of an asset's life. So this applies to any asset. 
not just a building that you've done a cost segregation on, but let's say you have bought uh, a new piece of machinery, or let's just say you've bought a copy copier. The bonus depreciation rules in the year one tell us how much of that we can go ahead and expense. So let's say this copier was $100,000. It used to be we had a 50% bonus depreciation rule. So we could go ahead and expense $50,000 of that copier, and then the remaining $50,000 would be capitalized and expense under the normal depreciation rules for that asset. The con Congress and the IRS, they change the bonus depreciation rules every year, and they do that in accordance with how they think they need to stimulate the economy. So they feel like when the bonus rules are higher, then more people are going to be inclined to buy capital assets. So right now, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we were given 100% bonus expensing. So everything that you buy in your business with a class size of, of 20 years or less, you can expense in year one. There are no limitations to this. It can take you into a loss. Uh, you can, as much as, as you purchase, you can go ahead and depreciate. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this sh slide shows us what the old depreciation rules were, and you can see that over the years, how they bounce up and down uh, with with different numbers, just depending on what the government wants to do in that year. So the reason why it is good to remember what the old bonus rules are, you need to always follow the rules that were in place at the time period that you placed your asset in service. So let's say that you were now realizing that you've bought all these assets in some of these time periods and you never took bonus, you could actually go back now and do that and put that on your current year return, the difference, and that would be with a change in accounting method. But you would need to follow the depreciation that was in uh, in the law in the time period that you put that asset in service. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, these are the new rules. So really, it's just the bottom uh, two lines that have changed. So now we have 100% bonus through the end of 2022. Between 2023 and 2026, it's gonna phase down um, by 20% each year. And then after that, I guarantee there will be new rules, so we really don't even need to think that far out. All right, next slide. So in order to apply, uh, the rules for applying the bonus depreciation have also changed with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we could only apply the bonus rules to new property. So the original use had to begin with the taxpayer. So if you bought an existing building, if you bought um, some used equipment for your restaurant, you could not apply bonus depreciation to the, those assets because technically the, the uh, owner previous to you had already taken bonus and they only allow it one time. So you could only take bonus depreciation if your asset was depreciable under makers. There are other methods that could potentially be depreciated under, so you want to just be careful there. Um, we already talked about having the recovery period of 20 years or less, and then previously we only had a 50% bonus depreciation rate. So after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was enacted, now they are going to allow bonus depreciation on new and used property. So that means that the first time use, that person can take, that owner can take 100% bonus, sell it to somebody else, cannot be a related party though, and then they can also take 100% bonus on that same asset. So every transaction, you are allowed to take bonus now, which that opens up a whole new wide world for taxpayers. Um, no change to, it still needs to be depreciable under makers. No change to the 20 years or less cost life. Of course, we've talked about 100% with the phase down versus the 50%. Um, but we also talked a little bit, and I'll just remind you again, that the asset must be acquired and placed in service after our magic 927.17 date, which is when the new bonus rules were applied. When you look at the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the entire package, most of all of the changes that were in that came about as of 1118 except for bonus depreciation. They decided to put that in place on 9-27-2017. So that last quarter of 17, 
you were allowed to apply 100% bonus to any assets that you purchased in that time period. All righty, next slide. Okay, so the devil is in the details. So let's walk through some of our details of applying bonus depreciation so that we can just make sure that it makes sense. So with the change from 50% to 100% bonus, we need to consider the acquisition date and the date that it was placed in service. So the acquisition date is generally the date that the asset is purchased. However, when you construct an asset or when you have a binding contract that exists before the actual purchase date, then the acquisition date is different. So when you are constructing an asset, you must follow the transition rules. Um, the, basically what the IRS says is for a constructed asset, your acquisition date is the date that you started construction. When you have purchased an asset, the date of your binding contract date, and that's the date that you made an offer and you signed it and maybe you put down some money um, for due diligence, that is going to be your binding contract date. So, I mean, your yes, your binding contract date, and that is now going to be considered your acquisition date, even though you haven't actually closed yet. So your place in service date, though, is generally the date the asset begins its use in the business. So for a building to be placed in service, the general rule follows that the certificate of occupancy is the date that we look at, and that's when you're going to start to use it for its intended function and when it's going to start to generate income. That's the date that you're going to put on your depreciation schedule and start taking those depreciation deductions. So your acquisition date is actually not recorded anywhere if it's different in your place and service date. So that is, these are all the items that your CPA will ask you about. So let's look at our example for a doggy day spa. So Sue plans to start a new doggy day spa. In July of 2017, she purchases all of the equipment to run this business. On November 1st, 2017, she opens her doors to her first furry clients. So how should she depreciate these assets? Both the acquisition date and the place and service date do not fall after the tax law change. So she must follow the old rules. So even though she purchased the equipment, that was her acquisition date, she cannot actually put them in service until she starts to use them in her business. So in that case, that's why her place and service date is different. So she is only allowed to take 50% bonus depreciation on these assets. Okay, next slide. All right, this is the exact same example. Um, she purchased her assets in July, and she now opened her doors in January of 2018. So this is when she's first starting to use her assets for the production of income. Well, because she has that acquisition date prior to the tax law change, we need to follow the old bonus rules, and we need to follow them all the way through. So in the old bonus rule chart, we showed you that in 2018, the old bonus rules were set to have 2018 bonus at 40%. So now that her place and service date is in 18, she's going to be bound to only taking 40% bonus in 2018. Okay, next slide, please. So our last example is she has now purchased all of her assets in November 17 and she has placed them in service in January 18, so a blend of our two examples, but just a slight difference. She just purchased her assets a few months later, so now she is allowed to take 100% bonus depreciation because under the new rules, 18 has 100% bonus as long as her acquisition date falls after the magic 9-27-18 date. So you can see how these nuances can really change your answer depending on your circumstances. Okay, next slide. All right, so now let's think about this in context of a much larger asset when we're thinking about a high-rise apartment complex. So LBD Housing is planning to build a 100-unit apartment complex. They purchased the land in April of 27 and began construction in July of 2017. Then they placed the apartments in service in July of 2018. I think I'm not, I meant to say 2017 a second ago. So 
what do you think is going to happen in this situation? So we know that April of 2017 and beginning construction, our actual date that we need to look at for our acquisition is not the date that we purchased the land. It's the date we began construction. So the July of 2017 is our acquisition date. And then our place and service date is going to be in 2018. So we're straddling our date again. So we are going to need to follow the old rules. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we are going to need to follow the 40% bonus rules in this case. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act allows bonus depreciation to be applied to used property, we talked about that, as well as new, new property, so that's great. Um, but there are, of course, some landmines in this application too, so let's talk about those. Okay, next slide. Okay, so let's talk about what used property is defined as. Used property is property which the first time use did not start with the taxpayer, but the asset must be considered new to the taxpayer. Okay, next slide. That means the taxpayer did not use the property at any time before acquiring it. The taxpayer did not acquire the property from a related party or a member of a controlled group. The taxpayer's basis in the property is not figured by reference to the adjusted basis in the hands of the seller, <clears throat> and the property basis is not stepped up. So what we're really talking about here is not a 31, 1031 exchange property. That is where you, you're going to calculate your basis in the new property based on your old basis. Things like that, you are not, that is not considered new to you, even though building might be new to you, the basis itself is not new. All right, so let's look at an example of bonus and use property. So Dove Real Estate LLC entered into a binding contract to purchase the building on 10-5-17, after our magic date. They closed on the building in January of 18. So can they apply the new bonus rules to the results of their cost segregation study? So of course, looks good. I think so. Now let's talk about 179 expensing. So we are still on the topic of what were the changes that happened in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. 179 expensing under the old rules, we were only allowed to expense $500,000 with a phase out beginning at $2 million. Now, going back to 179 expensing, if you're not familiar with what that is, this is another provision that the IRS gives us that allows us for any items that we purchase in a year, in the calendar year that need to be capitalized, they allow us to just go ahead and expense them. Now, this does not mean real property. It's only for shorter life property. So your machinery, your, your computers, your printers, all those type of things. So they have increased the limits for 179 expensing to $1 million with the phase out beginning at $2.5 million. Also for 179 expensing, you need to have taxable income. If you are in a loss situation, you cannot apply this. But it's an additional rule, kind of works like bonus, but it has these additional parameters. One thing though that is great and really awesome that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act gave us is they expanded the definition to a little bit some of the items in real property that they will now allow us to accelerate our expense under 179 expensing in year one. So after you place the building in service, so in subsequent periods, if you put on a new roof, if you put in a new HVAC system, fire protection system or security system, you're allowed to go ahead under 179 expensing and expense those costs. This is a great win for the taxpayer because these items do not last 39 years and taxpayers are finding they're having to replace this property quite a bit. And then all the new property they're buying, they're having to put it on again at 39 years, 39 years, and it was getting tedious. So being able to expense it on the onset is great. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so the IRS under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act has applied a limitation on business interest expense. 
So generally, they are limiting business interest expense to 30% of your adjusted taxable income. And your adjusted taxable income is your EBITDA before 2022, and thereafter, it's your EBIT. So they, right now, you can take your depreciation and your amortization expense before you get without considering your 30%, so it's not limiting you there. We'll walk through an example. And then after that, um, that is not going to be the case. So the calculation is going to change after five years. We're going to talk about how you might want to do some planning around this change. Okay, next slide. All right, so here is our example of how that works. So here is an example of a company's numbers for tax year 2018. You can see that they have a million dollars of interest expense and their taxable income with that whole expense dollar amount is $650,000. Well, when we calculate their EBITDA, we are going to have to add back interest, depreciation, and um, their interest income and their interest expense. So now that gives them an adjusted taxable income of $2.6 million. So they are only allowed to take interest expense up to 30% of that 2.6 million. So that's how we get the 794, and which is plugged into the tax return as filed. Now, after 2022, when our law changes, they are not going to allow us to add back depreciation. So in essence, that is going to give us a lower taxable income because we're going to have to take that as an expense first before we take our 30%. And so in effect, it's going to lower the amount of interest expense each year that we're going to be allowed to take. So thinking about that, it makes sense to front load as much of your depreciation as possible in all of the years before this happens so that your depreciation numbers are smaller. Therefore, your interest expense numbers can be higher based on, of course, your, your debt and your interest expense numbers. Okay, next slide. All right, these are the limitations on the business interest expense deduction, uh, the exceptions and the elections out. If you are a small business and you have annual gross receipts of less than $25 million, you are not going to need to worry about this at all. Um, if you're certain uh, regulated, regulated public utilities and electric, electric co-ops, you will not need to worry about this. Um, if you have floor plan financing, if you are real property trade or business, um, you can elect out of this provision, but you have to use the ADS method for all of your depreciation for your real property. Now, that is an interesting um, item because your real property is just your long life. So when you take your building and you do your cost segregation, those items that we were able to put into shorter life are no longer actually considered real property. They're considered tangible property. So it's only the remaining balance in 39 year or 27 and a half year that has to go to your ADS. So we do have a lot of clients right now that are electing out of the business interest limitation and taking their real property to ADS. And ADS is a different type of uh, depreciation calculation is also under makers. It only uses straight line. There's no accelerated. It's just a more slow application of depreciation. But for real property, interestingly enough, it is only takes 39 year to 40 year, and it takes your 27 and a half year residential to 30 year. So it's not actually a huge difference. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so now let's talk about some planning opportunities um, throughout the life cycle. And this is where we're going to talk about the tangible property regulations. Melanie, how much time do we have left? We have 14 minutes left. 14 minutes, okay. That should be, that should be perfect. All right, so when you think about the tangible property regulations, so now we're thinking about this is throughout our building life cycle where we're doing our repairs. So when we spend money, how do we need to treat that spend? So we're looking at improvements, renovations, and repairs. We're going to be asking ourselves these questions. So what we need to do is we need to decide for each spend item, should we, do we need to capitalize it or do we need to expense it? And if we need to capitalize it, then can we do a partial disposition? A partial disposition involves looking back at your original building purchase price or construction price 
and removing a piece of the value in that dollar amount that is equal to the same item that you had to capitalize. So, for example, let's say you put in a whole new HVAC system. You need to capitalize that. Well, I want to now dispose of the HVAC system that it was originally in my building price that I just had to get rid of and replace. So there are several different options here to allow you at least some expensing opportunities. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so did you acquire, build, or renovate your property after uh, 2002? Um, are you planning on doing it? And are you expanding your current building? Do you have any um, demolitions? Are you doing tenant improvements? Do you have any inherited property? All of these times when you're doing a step up in bases, these are when you need to start thinking about your tangible property regulations. Okay, next slide. All right. So the best thing to do is to walk through um, a retail plaza example. This is going to help you really understand what we're going to do. So let's say we constructed a new building in 2016 for roughly $1.8 million. We have lots of tenants in our space, and we put them in place as our construction progresses. Okay, next slide. We did a cost segregation on this building, and of that dollar amount, we were able to reclassify the following into 5, 15, 39 year property. Um, you can see we have the QIP definition. I know I haven't mentioned that. Currently, the QIP definition is qualified improvement property. That encompasses three old rules, which were qualified restaurant property, qualified leasehold improvement property, and the old definition of qualified improvement property. Currently, the IRS has that as a 39-year class life when historically those items had a 15-year class life. So what I would suggest you do is to keep them separated on your depreciation schedule with 39-year life so that if the IRS changes that rule, you can go back and grab that and do a 3115, which is an accounting method change, to calculate any difference in prior years that that, change would, that would result from that change in your taxable income. All right, next slide, please. All right, so when we put all of our items on our depreciation schedule, this is how it looks. We have our site and shell, our class life breakouts. We have my eye doctor, a Dr. Moore, and a vein specialist. These are our tenants in our current space. And as you can see, they moved in at different times, so we have different place and service dates. Okay, next slide. So in year one, we were able to accelerate 55.9% of the building cost, and our year one bonus depreciation was over half a million dollars. So we saved $212,000 in tax that very first year. With our cost segregation study, we were able to determine all of our units of properties for our building, and we also placed the remaining building in a general asset account. Okay, next slide. Okay, so in years 2 through 25, we are doing a lot of repairs and maintenance as our building ages. Okay, next slide. So each time we have spend for our repairs and maintenance, we first want to look at our company's de minimis expensing policy. Your accountant can help you set this. There are some rules, but as a general idea, most companies have a de minimis expensing policy between $1,000 and $2,500. So when you look at it's a per item or a per invoice um, analysis. So if you buy 10 chairs and each of those chairs are $200, you're just going to go ahead and expense them. You don't have to apply any other thought processes or steps to that analysis. Then you're going to look at your company's capitalization policy and then you want to make sure that you adhere to that. Now you want to, thirdly, you want to apply your tangible property regulations. And we are going to talk about those in detail as to what they say as to when you should expense and when you should capitalize an item. And then lastly, if you are required in step three to capitalize, then you can look to partially disposing a portion of your original old asset. Okay, next slide. Um, okay, so in year five, we needed some work done to the parking lot. So the owner spent $25,000 for striping and resurfacing. So 
So what the tangible property regulations tell us, that there are three things that we need to consider for every spend to determine whether it's expense or capitalized. Did the spend make the property better? Was it a betterment? Did it restore it from a period of disuse? Or did it adapt the item to a new use? Well, we know that just restriping and resurfacing did not adapt our parking lot to a new use. It was a parking lot before, a parking lot after. We know it was not a restoration because we were using it the whole time right before and after we did the restriping. And then it did not make it a betterment either because it's still exactly the same. A betterment is it did increase capacity. Um, is it better or does it have a different function than it did before? So if you answer no to all of those questions, you can expense your item. A lot of taxpayers get hung up on the spend. So let's say you have a very large parking lot and this costs you half a million dollars. They think that's a lot of money. I'm sure I need to capitalize it. The tangible property regulations do not say at any point that you have to think about the dollar value. There's no dollar value attributed to that. So it is simply, is it a betterment? Is it a restoration or is it an adaptation? If you say no to all three, then you can expense it. Okay, next slide. Okay, that's just talking about what we just talked about, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so now let's talk about an HVAC uh, replacement. This, there's so many questions around HVAC replacements because anybody who owns a building has had to deal with this at some point. So we have two of our HVAC units that stopped working and they need to be replaced. Now, one of the things we have not talked about is we, we roughly did on one slide a building per the IRS is broken out into eight different units of property. And by that, they say, well, the building itself is one unit of property, but then there's eight different subsystems. So when we apply our rules, we're going to look at, we're going to say that a betterment to our subsystem happened if we replaced more than 30% of that subsystem. So this is one of the questions, you know, really what does the betterment mean? Well, we, and there are some examples in the regs that kind of give us a percentage. So if you're replacing an entire system, they're going to say that's a betterment. So when we look at HVACs, we're going to look at how many HVACs do you have in your building? And then we're going to come up with a percentage of the HVACs that were replaced. And based on that percentage, we're going to determine whether that was a betterment and it needs to be capitalized or you're below that percentage threshold and you can go ahead and expense them. Okay, so next slide. So our question that we're going to ask is, how many total HVACs are in this building? This building happens to have eight. So two out of eight is only 25%. So based on that information, we can go ahead and expense this. Oh, it's one of our eight. Okay, I said that wrong. So I said there's, if there were eight HVACs, we could expense it. But in this building, actually only has four. So in that case, our HVAC, the two that we replaced, is 50% of our units, so we're going to capitalize it. So since we're going to capitalize these HVAC units, we can go back in our original purchase of our building and expense two, which is 50% of the HVAC system in that. The only way we're going to know what that dollar value is is if we look at our cost segregation study. If we have not had a cost segregation study done on the building, there's really almost no way for you to determine what that value is, so you're not going to be able to do that partial disposition. Okay, next slide. All right, now we get to the end of our building's life, and we have decided that we want to demolish the building and rebuild it with an office tower. We've decided that's going to be the highest and best use for our property. Um, so normally, when you demolish a building, the, the cost of the demolition and the remaining net book value of that building needs to go into the basis of the land, which, as we talked about at the onset of this presentation, has no uh, depreciation value to it. It just sits um, and does not allow any expensing on your capitalization schedule. So, but since we had put this asset into a general asset account at the very first year we placed it in service, we are allowed to continue to appreciate that cost of that building as if nothing happened on our tax return. 
So that is just something to think about. Um, it's a long-term consideration, but it's something to think about doing if you think you are going to hold your buildings for a long period of time. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I don't think we'll have time to talk about recapture, um, but we can kind of quickly go through it. If you want to click to the next slide, I can talk about recapture in like three minutes. So recapture, the purpose of recapture is to the IRS, when you sell a building, if you sell the building at a higher value than its net book value, the net book value is your original cost less the depreciation deductions taken to date, then that means that you just got an expense against ordinary income for something that actually appreciated in value. So what they, the IRS wants you to go back to do is go back and grab those depreciation deductions and pay a higher tax rate on them that is higher than the capital gains tax rate. In a nutshell, that's what depreciation recapture is. Okay, next slide. Um, this is a basic example that kind of makes it clear why the IRS does not like this. So let's say you purchased a red wagon in 2017 for $500. Then you took your 179 expense deduction uh, for the entire amount. So you were able to take $500 as a reduction to your income and you saved $185 in tax because your rate is 37%. So one year and one day later, so now you've held the asset for a year, you're entitled to capital gains uh, tax rate. You sell this asset for the same dollar amount that you bought it for, which is $500. Well, the capital gains tax rate is favorable. It's only 20%. So you only have to pay $100 in tax on that gain, but you were able to save $185 the year before. So you automatically made $85 in income without really doing anything. So this is why the IRS has come up with the concept of depreciation recapture. All right, does anybody have any questions? Hey Don, thank you so much for presenting. Right now it looks like we don't have any questions, but like I said, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out myself, Melanie at mountainseed.com, or Don as well. Um, Don, thank you so much again for taking the time to go through this. I know we didn't get to get through all of it, but um, it was such a great presentation, and we are so appreciative to have you. Thank you very much, Melanie. I appreciate that. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Have a good one.